intractable epilepsies in childhood, um, which is uh, not an uncommon problem, I would say. And um, in this topic, uh, it's a vast topic. So you, you have a lot of conditions to discuss, but I won't be going through all the conditions, but mostly I'm uh, talking about the common uh, ones that you may encounter in your practice. Um, so uh, in, what, in brief, what I'm uh, proposing to talk today is about what, what do you mean by intractability in epilepsy? And uh, also, uh, what are the latest findings? Uh, and if you're talking about intractable epilepsy, you know that we are talking about polypharmacy or multiple drugs. So how and why we use multiple drugs in some patients and, and uh, how the multiple drugs can harm the patients in a way. And also briefly about the management uh, options that are available other than medicines or anti-epileptic drugs. And uh, then also uh, taking you through a few case scenarios that will probably uh, have make you better understand the topic. Uh, and also what we can do with these patients uh, if you encounter one of them. So, um, when it comes to intractable epilepsy, you know, uh, the uncontrolled epilepsy, the drug-resistant epilepsy, and refractory epilepsy are the synonyms um, for this term. And uh, if you look at the world literature, about one-third of adults with epilepsy uh, have intractable epilepsy. So that is about 30%. And when it comes to children, it's not less. Actually, it's about 20 to 25%, which is about one-fourth of the children with epilepsy uh, are having intractable epilepsy, so which is quite a high uh, proportion, I would say. When you uh, come to the definition or the importance of this, uh, there is no 100% uh, you know, as a definition for intractability, but uh, some studies have shown us different uh, aspects that you need to consider when you talk about intractable epilepsy. Uh, so, if you use uh, two tolerated and appropriately chosen anti-epileptic schedules, if they fail, whether they use as monotherapies or in combination, to achieve a sustained seizure freedom, then you consider it as an intractable epilepsy. So, uh, for example, if I say if we start using sodium valproate for a generalized epilepsy and, and we have used the appropriate uh, dosing, and the child tolerates it well, and we have gone, gone to the maximum level of it, and still it does not control his epilepsy, and plus if we want to give another drug, if, since it doesn't settle, maybe we say a topiramate or a lamotrigine, uh, maybe as a combination or monotherapy, and we go into the top most uh, level of that drug as well, and uh, if they don't respond, then we uh, consider it as an intractable epilepsy. Um, and uh, there are a, a few studies done at different points uh, in the last decade. Uh, what they suggest is the drug resistance uh, for epilepsy is uh, valid only for that point in time. Say we detect it for the last six months, then that is uh, valid for that point in time. But does not imply that the patient will never become seizure free. So basically, that gives us further chance to manipulate with certain anticonvulsants. So that was like in the last decade. And then um, even the latest reviews have shown that, uh, I will come to that later, but these are the initial things that we found uh, for the first, uh, first uh, description. So if uh, when we talk about drug responsiveness, now we know that uh, we were talking about uh, refractability, but now if we are saying drug responsiveness, so that means uh, so she has, or if she or he or she has been seizure free for a minimum of three times the longest pre treatment inter seizure interval, meaning that uh, before the treatment, if the child had an inter seizure interval of three months, and if this child has been seizure free following the drug treatment for about nine months or more, that means that the child is having drug responsiveness. Or they take it as 12 months or one year, roughly, whichever is longer. So obviously, if one year is used, that means the one year is a longer duration than the 10 months. So that is how we describe the drug responsiveness. 
So before talk, now when you talk about intractable epilepsy, we have to see why these patients are having uncontrolled seizures. Uh, if it is not epilepsy, I mean, if it is not epilepsy, we know that there are pseudo seizures, we know that non-epileptic events are happening in children. So if it is not epilepsy, however much we treat, we may not get a response. So obviously that, that goes under the intractability. So you need to be very sure that we are dealing with an epilepsy. Other thing is the wrong treatment. Now, some medications can worsen certain types of seizures. You know that carbamazepine for abscesses or myoclonic seizures for that matter will worsen this uh, seizures. Or if the child is having um, a continuous uh, epileptic seizure uh, discharges, like uh, continuous uh, uh, slow wave uh, in sleep. So that will worsen if you give carbamazepine. And other thing is now, despite the best treatment, the triggers or lifestyle factors may affect the seizure control. For example, if, the, if there is a poor compliance or as in adolescence, if there is, a, I mean, we are talking about children here. Uh, so up to about 14, 16 years we look after. And in adolescence, they may have sleep deprivation and they may uh, have the other recreational activities. So with those things, sometimes the lifestyle factors may uh, affect the seizure control as well. And also, now, supposing we diagnose the seizures or epilepsy properly, but in, sometimes it may not respond to the best of the medical treatment that we have. So that is either pharmacokinetics or dynamics, uh, depends on that patient. So with this uh, thing in mind, now we have uh, we have used several medications at once in certain patients which is called polypharmacy and whether uh, that will cause toxicity that is the major problem that we have in this intractable epilepsy so there have been two important studies by these people uh, they have found that if a person is not seizure free on a good dosage of a single anti-epileptic then adding a second one will make them seizure free by about 30%. So that means that they have a, another one third chance that they can become seizure free. And also now earlier the thought was that after adding two, two, the third or the fourth one will add to side effects but not the control of the drug. But the latest study in 2020, uh, 19 and 20, they have published it in 20, said that adding the third uh, third would make a seizure freedom of about 25%, so which is a fair amount that we can uh, uh, expect because earlier it was only 2 to 3%, that's what the studies were showing. So uh, then comes the concept of rational polytherapy. So that means you are using several drugs, maybe 1, 2 and 3, but you have to be concerned about the mechanistic combination. So like. Um, we are using sodium valproate, maybe lamotrigine, plus a clobosam, but that has to be mechanistically uh, looked at into, and the combinations of anti-epileptics has to be mechanic mechanistically tallied them, and they have, should have a synergistic activity with the new anti-epileptics. So this is the latest uh, study that uh, they have done in nine, 2019, they have published that. So that means we have some array of hope with the medications, uh, as uh, what we knew earlier was kind of changing right now. But of course, while talking about these multiple anticonvulsants, you have to be aware of the side effects, the drug interactions, and of course, when you are changing a regime, that you need to be carefully, uh, he, the patient needs to be under a careful supervision of a neurologist, and then of course, uh, to see and you know, tailor the anticonvulsants dose to a particular uh, level so that it will uh, get the seizure control as well as the side effect profile. So it's basically a balancing between the risk and the benefit. Okay, so uh, when you have true drug resistant epilepsy or true intra uh, intractable epilepsy, uh, obviously when you encounter such a patient, uh, they, they need to be promptly referred to an epilepsy clinic. As we know in Sri Lanka, now we have uh, pediatric neurologists uh, who are uh, scattered around the country. So obviously uh, uh, that needs to be referred to that sort of a clinic where they have much expertise in managing these patients. So what are these negative, if you say, if 
uh, if we have a patient with true drug resistance, so what are the negative consequences? Obviously, with our patients, uh, with our cohort of patients, we encounter the developmental delays and intellectual disability, which is a major component in children. And then, of course, they are more prone to get injuries. And there is an increased risk of pseudep. Pseudep is the sudden un unexpected deaths in epilepsy, which is not highly spoken of in uh, pediatrics. However, we have encountered, although it's not common, adults it's very common, but uh, when it comes to pediatrics, it's not a common entity. So, uh, and we don't even talk to uh, parents about this uh, entity because it's not so common as we see in adults. But there's a risk, so that has to be uh, that has to be taken into account. And also, when it comes to children, the emotional and behavioral problems are a major issue. So, when it when it comes to the school and uh, you know, at family uh, and as siblings, they have a lot of behavioral issues and emotional issues, which has to be uh, controlled uh, in a major way. And when they become adults or adolescents, then the occupational outcomes may be less and also uh, they are at risk of side effects to multiple anti-seizure medications because they are having true drug resistant epilepsy, which we need to treat. So, uh, so when you have this drug resistant epilepsy, what are the other treatment options we have? So we know that there are uh, conditions where we can manage with a resective epilepsy surgery. Like for example, if we have a temporal lobe uh, condition like a mesial temporal sclerosis, we can have a uh, surgery to remove that part of the temporal lobe, which has a 50 to 70 percent, which is a fair amount, fair percentage of achieving the seizure freedom. So they are seizure free, they, they may become seizure free and subsequently we may be able to take them off the anticonvulsants. And then the latest uh, thing that they have uh, looked into is the laser ablation of the epileptogenic zone, where the laser probe burns the area of, area of the brain causing seizures, which causes less, uh, uh, less manipulations and the surgical risk and the surgical manipulations are less. So that is the latest uh, sort of a newer development in surgery. So uh, then there are instances where we are unable to uh, where we are unable to uh, manage this by surgery because there are certain conditions we can manage by surgery, but there are others where we cannot manage by surgery. So uh, especially with the uh, the GLUT1 deficiency, the metabolic conditions where GLUT1 is a gene that we find in certain uh, epilepsy syndromes and pyridoxal, uh, pyridoxine dependency and vitamin dependent epilepsies, we may not be able to achieve the seizure control by uh, using drugs. So we may have to use the ketogenic diet or treatment with pyridoxine or pyridoxal phosphate for these uh, vitamin deficient uh, dependent epilepsies, but this differs from, uh, the, from one condition to the other. Then we know that there are certain genetic epilepsies where uh, like one such thing I have taken an example is the SCN1A or the soothing channel 1A which needs combination therapy and they have intractable epilepsy. But obviously with the combination therapy they have uh, improved their outcomes. And then TSC1 and 2 is the tuberous sclerosis complex and there are there is a newer medication that have come in uh, that is Everolimus which is uh, now uh, licensed to use in the US. Uh, then there are certain immune epilepsies, which I will come to later in my talk. And uh, one such uh, example is Rasmussen's encephalitis. Uh, then, uh, then the dietary therapy is the ketogenic diet. We are all familiar with the ketogenic diet uh, these days because we know that we want to, if we want to reduce our weight, we use the ketogenic diet. But in epilepsy, the ketogenic diet is used in uh, uh, you know, you have to uh, meticulously manage it because uh, we want to make the, uh, when we want to have the ketones in the body and we want to have the ketosis, uh, so the ketones are being used as the fuel in the brain. So therefore, it has to be meticulously managed unlike that what we use in our day-to-day, -day, uh, you know, managing the weight reduction. 
And then uh, there is another palliative procedure, which is the vagus nerve stimulation, which is like a pacemaker that we insert. I will show you the pictures of that. And then the deep brain stimulation uh, using electrodes in the brain, uh, the deep, uh, you know, the, the areas where the thalamus and the basal ganglia, and then the responsive neuro uh, stimulation, and other, some other palliative surgical options, which is uh, not really uh, focusing on a lesion, but if they have recurrent drop seizures, there is a, a chance that the corpus callosotomy may help it. So if I, if I just go into the types of epilepsy surgery, uh, I have, sorry. See the uh, picture here, where in blue I have said that there is a lesion in the that's a glioma. So if you have a tumor, that you can take off the tumor, which is called the uh, lesionectomy, and then um, the whole lobe can be taken off, which is called the lobectomy. That is uh, especially in temporal lobe seizures. And then um, you can see in green is the hemisphere. So if you take a, if you have a hemispherical problem, like in a Sturge Weber syndrome, I'll show you the pictures later, you can take that hemisphere off or you can structurally disconnect it. Uh, so you don't take it off as such physically, but you structurally disconnect it. Um, and then uh, the corpus callosotomy, you know what the corpus callosum means, it's the midline structure, the white structure that uh, bends uh, between the two hemispheres. So you can do a corpus callosotomy, especially in the case of intractable drop attacks. So that means uh, always this corpus callosum is the bridge between the two uh, cerebral hemispheres. So when you uh, knock off the bridge or disconnect the bridge, then there's no chance that they can uh, from one lobe to the other, so the drop attacks will stop. And then there's another thing in purple, which is the subpale transaction, which is done in special conditions. Uh, one such condition is landau kleffner syndrome, again, the intractable epilepsy, one of the epilepsy syndromes, where you basically scrape off the areas that the discharges are coming from, which is called the subpale, so it's a subpale beyond the, like, it's underneath the PL meter, so which is called the sub -PL transaction. This is being used uh, in patients who have intractability in uh, Lando Kleffner. Um, I will come to that disorder uh, in a while with the symptoms and the signs that we look for. So the diet, the ketogenic diet is uh, something where we use ketones more, so we use a lot of meat, oil, and fat. Uh, and we basically take off the carbohydrates. So that is what is shown in the below picture. We take off the carbohydrates mostly. In the classical one, uh, the, the carbohydrates that we give are very minimal. But in the modified, we will give carbohydrates uh, to a lesser extent, but we will uh, give the fats and the proteins to a major component. So the fats and the proteins. So medium chain triglycerides are the ones that we use. And of course, when you talk about ketogenic diet, this is not a new therapy. This has been there since 1920. So it's about like a decade or uh, not a few decades now that we have been having it. Uh, but only thing, um, uh, the ketogenic diet has not been used very frequently due to the uh, practical difficulty uh, to use it in children. Uh, and it's effective in many childhood epilepsy, not only to control the seizures, but also to uh, uh, improve the development and the behavior. But of course, it needs parental in involvement. And of course, if there are other children in the family, so that they also can't use sugars and carbohydrates, because otherwise this child will get, uh, I mean, there's hardly, uh, we cannot get control this child. So obviously there are other side effects like hypoglycemias, hyperlipidemias and protein deficiencies and diarrhea and constipation. So uh, that makes the ketogenic diet failing in the long term, especially with the compliance as the child grows. So this is the vagal nerve stimulator, which is like a pacemaker and it's a pulse generator. So uh, it is a uh, it's a small surgery where you uh, implant it to the vagus nerve. Uh, but it has its own side effects, obviously, because the vagus nerve is involved. So you have hoarseness of voice, there may be cough and throat pain. And um, it is actually equivalent to another drug. Um, 
However, it's not a curative treatment. It's just a palliative treatment. So that means you may reduce the seizures to a certain extent, but not 100%. So when you take the outcome of these uh, uh, methods that we use, uh, so a patient who is coming with this epilepsy will remit uh, about 80% actually. Will become satiated with anti-epileptics. So the next 20% will be intractable. And then out of the 20%, 30% of them will be surgical candidates. Maybe some lesion is there that we can correct by surgery. And the um, and out of that also about 70% will become seizure free after surgery but then the rest that comes to about totally about 25% will remain uh, intractable. How do we manage them? So ideally it has to be multidisciplinary because they have long term problems uh, especially in children the development is a problem and uncontrolled seizures are a problem and then uh, intellectual disability is a problem and the neurosurgeon will have to intervene with surgery, the eye, the ENT, uh, and the therapist and the neuropsychologist. So all these people need to get involved, uh, including the local general practitioner or the MOH who will look after the, uh, the compliance and things and also the social worker to involve with the family circumstances. In general, the control, I mean, our aims would be to achieve the control of seizures and we have to facilitate the care for these children and the main uh, thing that we do by giving these um, methods of treatment would be to improve the functions of this child and giving special school and everything um, and uh, the, then you have to treat the associated problems like visual impairments, uh, the hearing problems and all those things and uh, it has to be family directed because the family has to be uh, geared to manage this person and also take up the treatment that we prescribe. Okay, so with that in mind, so this is the basic uh, outline, we will go into the case scenarios. So case scenario one is a 10 year old boy is, you know, who comes to the hospital from school following a generalized seizure in class. He was treated with antiemetics and H2 blockers for episodes of abdominal discomfort. And then his mother reports that his behavior is strange when he has this abdominal discomfort. So some time to time he has been having this and the mother has noted some strange uh, behavior in that. And there's a film, the past history of a febrile seizure lasting 45 minutes when he was 18 months of age. That was the only significant thing. And on examination after the seizure he was a little drowsy but has no focal neurological signs. You analyze this patient. So abdominal discomfort is associated with the strange behavior. Is this an aura? Could this be an aura? So then in that case, is this generalized seizure that the teacher witnessed? Is it a primary generalized or a secondary generalized seizure? And also, what sort of aura is this? Could it be arising from the temporal lobe? So we know that the temporal lobe auras consist of mostly gastrointestinal symptoms, upper GI symptoms like retching, rising sensation, that are the typical ones. And then the EEG is done subsequently shows the temporal discharge. There's an imaging here. If you can um, show the uh, one on the left side is a normal MRI frame. And then the left, uh, sorry, the right one shows on the right side there's a right mesial temporal, temporal sclerosis where uh, it's a bit. Uh, yeah, this one, you can see that the signal is uh, a bit uh, uh, darker or right, uh, a bit hyper intense and also the small uh, uh, medial, uh, medial temporal lobe, right? So uh, ultimately, once these investigations are done, this was a temporal lobe epilepsy with right hippocampal sclerosis. So we know that the drugs are not going to work here. So this patient was treated with anti-epileptics but did not respond. Therefore, we had to, uh, we tried a little, uh, like the intractability was uh, positive where we used two drugs and did not respond. So obviously, we went in for a surgery and the child became seizure free after the surgery. So it is very important that we detect them uh, with the history and the, uh, of course, by the investigations and then uh, treating them appropriately. So 
moving on to the case scenario two. So this is a six-year-old boy uh, who was uh, born at a POA of 28 weeks. And he was having a stormy neonatal period and has multiple seizures a day with varying semiology. So he was uh, treated at five months for infantile spasms, which you all know, uh, with steroids, with initially a good response, but seizures recurred after 10 months of age. So he was given many uh, multiple anticonvulsants, valproate, clobazam, and topiramate, and also tried a course of methylprednisolone. But the seizures did not improve. And his uh, development wise, he has global developmental delay and he attends a special school right now. So then a clinical diagnosis of Lennox Castor syndrome was made. And you know that this patient has an infantile spasms of West syndrome. And then I didn't talk about West syndrome here because you all know about that. And uh, then um, you know that once you graduate from that end by five months, then by about one year, two years, they become. Uh, they come into this lennox castor syndrome, which is the most severe and intractable seizure syndrome in child. Word about lennox castor syndrome, there's a classic triad, which is the cognitive impairment, multiple seizure types. It could be generalized, it could be focal, it could be myoclinic, it could be uh, uh, the ATP collapses. So there could be many seizure types and, uh, and head drops or drop attacks. Um, and then it will have a specific ages pattern. So if you uh, have this triad in a patient, you have to consider the lennox gastro syndrome. So I'm showing you EG here, which is a normal EG in the awake state. Now you can see this CG. This is a patient with lennox gastro syndrome. You can see that uh, this CG has a lot of discharges and they are continuous, right? And uh, this is another better view of that. This is in sleep. This child has continuous seizure discharges. And in lennox castor syndrome, the paroxysmal fast activity, the fast activity that you see here is a classic thing. So if you have paroxysmal fast activity and uh, slow spike and wave activity in sleep, you, with the other history, you can almost always consider lennox castor syndrome as the diagnosis and this is the clinical plus investigations just the EG alone you can diagnose you don't actually need a MRI to detect this condition right so there is a uh, 2021 January they have uh, published a paper in treatment options in lennox castor syndrome we know that it's a very uh, intractable seizure disorder um, so uh, there have been very, uh, the first line drugs that uh, has been used is valproate. It's not monotherapy all the time. It has been polytherapy, valproate and clobazam, valproate and lamotrigine. And then uh, the second line drugs, they have used uh, uh, rufinamide, uh, topiramate, the levetiracetam, zonisamide. So there are levetiracetam. So those are like in US, these have been used. And also they have used non-pharmacotherapies uh, ketogenic diet, the vagal nerve, callosotomy, receptive surgery if they found something. So, and then there's another new drug called felbamate, which has been used, and you can see that there are several other drugs in trial as well. And then uh, the latest addition by the US uh, Drug Authority is the cannabidiol, the ca cannabis, uh, the cannabidiol is the drug. So, they have shown some promising results with LGS, but it's not. 100%. So there are certain trials that have come back as a positive, like a 70% improvement in their seizures, but it's only like they have used only uh, like few patients. Obviously, it is a rare condition. So uh, they have used about 50 or 60 in one trial and the other one used about 55. So again, it's too early for us to as to whether it's a 100% by this drug but again uh, to tell you that it's mainly a combination therapy with other drugs. So uh, that's about lennox gastro syndrome so there are many therapies that have been used but still these patients are having problems and uh, the refractability or the retract, uh, intractability remains. Then case scenario three 
A three-year-old boy who presents with a generalized focal and myoclonic seizures occurring frequently despite multiple antigen muscles. So he has many types, multiple types of seizures. And uh, the main history that we have to take is that he has prolonged febrile conversion. Always he has, when he has a febrile conversions, it was lasting 20 to 30 minutes. So they are very prolonged. Uh, since the age of six months, he's been having this. And he has a neurodevelopmental delay with poor cognition. When we did the MRI brain, it shows non-significant atrophy. And EEG uh, is shown here uh, with uh, photic stimulation. You can see that this green line is the photic stimulation that we do. That's the provocation method that we use uh, while doing EEGs. So you can see that there are generalized discharges. And there's a continuous discharge again following the photic stimulation. So that means um, this child has a photosensitive epilepsy and which is an intractable one with multiple seizure types. So then uh, with the clinical history of prolonged febrile conversions and then uh, the MRI being non-specific and the psychomotor delay uh, and this uh, EEG which shows photosensitivity uh, went ahead and did the genetic mutation SCN1A that is the sodium channel 1A. Uh, and uh, then it was found to be positive. So this is a case of Dravet syndrome or severe myoclonic epilepsy of infancy. So you know that these patients are uh, very intractable and they have all these developmental delays and things. But again, in Dravet syndrome, uh, when, you, uh, when you look at the treatment, initially we may start with the valproic acid or valproate or a clobazam uh, and maybe in combination. Uh, and then the second line, there's a drug called steripentol, which is not used, uh, which is not re uh, registered in Sri Lanka yet, and it's expensive, but uh, has been used since the uh, uh, like the last decade, uh, which is kind of uh, targeting at the sodium channel where uh, this defect is. So some patients it has shown some promise, but of course some of them did not. So topiramate. Uh, or ketogenic diet have been tried, but again, uh, with uh, not much of an improvement. And then there are some addi other additions like clonazepam, levetiristam, those are the third line drugs. Uh, and then ultimately, they, some of these patients had to go in for vagus nerve stimulation, that is for the uh, palliative kind of seizure control. So you can see that uh, the genetic epilepsies, I took only one example, that these patients can be uh, psychomotor delay and then um, having uh, uh, intractability into anticonversions. But uh, then now this, uh, I have to say that SCN1A is a spectrum. So some of these patients have improved uh, very well to evaluate and clobazam. But uh, there are uh, percentage where they have to go into this level and then still remain intractable. So we don't know where our patient will be until we assess the clinical uh, uh, clinical uh, features. Right. Going into case scenario four, uh, the four-year-old girl presents with multiple generalized seizures in sleep and then uh, subsequently progressed to develop seizures when uh, she is awake as well. And she was speaking in two word sentences before the onset of seizures. And then the parents uh, definitely said there's a gradual regression of speech. So the person who was speaking in two word sentences declined in his speech and then uh, uh, and was a friendly child earlier, but uh, did not show her normal friendly behavior afterwards. So this child has seizures. Uh, especially in sleep and also uh, he had she had a very prominent speech regression where now this child does not even uh, speak uh, and sometimes uh, actually uh, she behaves as she is deaf that is the mother's complaint. Uh, so uh, when we did the EEG the awake EEG showed slow background with no epileptiform discharge so the background was abnormal but there were no epileptiform discharge but in me to this EEG there was continuous slow spike and wave discharge. I showed you a EG like that before. So it was a continuous discharging EG. And of course, the MRI brain didn't show any abnormality. So this is a EG again uh, in uh, sleep. This is the um, epileptic form discharges in sleep or uh, is what we call. So several anticonversants were used and but failed. 
tried to try some uh, uh, steroids as well like methylprednisolone and then these are the patients who may sometimes benefit with subpill trans uh, transection but unlike other surgeries we don't have a real uh, sort of a uh, place where we have to do this but there are in some patients there are uh, there are areas that we can uh, identify with the video telemetry so we may go ahead with that type of uh, areas to do this scraping kind of surgery uh, and uh, the prognosis is variable in many uh, usually they come with neurocognitive decline and their speech may not return to normal in majority but some of them might catch up a little later so uh, this is Lando Kleffner syndrome or acquired auditory agnosia. Uh, so this comes in as a normal child who has been developing normal and then subsequently uh, having these clinical features. Right. Okay. So, um, so I'm just not going to now talk about the cases again, but I thought I will just uh, highlight the other things uh, on neurocutaneous syndromes which is again an important uh, entity where when we talk about intractable epilepsy, we know that uh, tuberous sclerosis is one such thing that you have to know. Um, uh, as a pediatrician, this is something that you should not miss. Uh, and it's autosomal dominant intelligence and prevalence is not very common. It's one in about 6,000. And uh, variable phenotypic presentations are seen. And we know that TSEC1 and TSEC2 genes are right now and they are approximately seen about uh, closer to like 85 to 90 percent and the seizures are common in about 80 percent and many present with infantile spasms and but however other seizure types also can be seen and in these patients vigabatrin is the first line treatment for infantile spasms and um, now the latest treatment is Everolimus, that is uh, mTOR kinase inhibitor that is uh, identified and uh, registered in the FDA that's in the uh, US, uh, especially when these patients encounter uh, in SEGAs or uh, like the giant cell astrocytomas, uh, it, it, said it, uh, it reduces the astrocytoma as well as now recently they have tried it on seizures and they have found good results but Everolimus has other side effects. Um, it's like a you know anti-cancer drug so it has all the side effect and, and it is a costly drug uh, to be used. Right. So there are a few clinical uh, criteria to diagnose DSE for intrinsic I put it. There are major criteria and minor criteria. For definite diagnosis, you need two major criteria and one major or one major uh, and two minor criteria. So there is a possible diagnosis, either one major, one major and one minor, not more than two minor features. So you know that angiofibromas, hypomelanotic macules, angular fibromas, chagrin patch, there should be a number that has to be there, and cortical dysplasia, so ependymal nodules, and uh, uh, giant cell astrocytomas, cardiac rhabdomyomas, and all these things are major features, and then other enamel pits, intraoral fibromas. Uh, this is found in any textbook, so you can find it, and confidence stimulations and multiple renal cysts. These are some pictures you can see there's Ashley Macules, right, and the angular fibromas, uh, adenoma sebaceum, right, so different uh, nails and dental pits and all those things are here. Uh, so in tuberous sclerosis, so you need to examine your patient carefully, when, especially when they present at uh, four months or five months with a to uh, infantile spasm with a, uh, because at that time he is not diagnosed as tuberous sclerosis. You need to find out whether they have tuberous sclerosis or not. And the typical MRI findings are there. Even if you don't see the child, if you see a MRI, you should be able to diagnose the tuberous sclerosis. The subependymal nodules will show the candlestick appearance, and then these uh, white areas are the cortical tubers. So it's not difficult to diagnose. Tuberous sclerosis. These two things has to be there for you to confirm that it's a tuberous sclerosis. Coming on to the other, uh, another neurocutaneous syndrome, the Sturge Weber syndrome. Um, so this is a sporadic neurocutaneous disorder, and you have a facial port wine, 
and usually unilateral involves the ophthalmic maxillary and the mandibular areas of the fifth nerve and uh, the CNS the brain is uh, the angioma spreads over the that same side usually uh, in all three areas so these patients can develop hemiparesis, hemiatrophy and homonymous hemianopias and cognitive delays and also intractable uh, focal seizures. And the treatment here would be hemispherectomy, that is the one that I showed you earlier with the surgery that you either disconnect or take off a hemisphere. But of course following the surgery they may be hemiplegic but in these patients whom we are we will have to do hemispherectomy, it will be in any way hemiplegic due to the condition itself. So there is uh, a chance of getting a seizure freedom, but however, the patient may be hemiplegic. That is a side effect of the, or rather the complication of the surgery because you are taking one hemisphere off. Then there are other neurocutaneous syndromes, neurocutaneous melanosis, where we have the giant cell melanocytes and then the lesions in the brain and the spinal cord and these lesions in the brain can cause epilepsy they are intractable if you need to take it off then uh, <coughs> you have to do surgery to control it and then there's hypomelanosis of it all where the children can present with various uh, types of seizures. Uh, finally, uh, the immune-mediated epilepsy, which is upcoming, uh, an upcoming uh, cause for epilepsies. So they have multifocal neurologic signs and symptoms. They include the <coughs> intractable epilepsy, a psychiatric disorder. They end up in the psychiatric ward. The cognitive dysfunction, the movement disorders, sleep dysfunctions, and autonomic dysfunctions. So this is uh, these are the ways that they present to us and they may have acute or some acute scores and also sometimes a progressive course so they, the, some patients may very, present very acute, acutely and they may even die of this but uh, some of them may have like a, a course of illness about one to two weeks or three weeks and then some of them may be months so you need to be careful in assessing these patients and you have to keep this in mind that this can be one of the causes if you don't find anything um, and the investigations and the history to tally with any of the others. So I'm just uh, talking to you about three conditions that you have to know. Uh, one is Rasmussen encephalitis, which is a rare condition. Uh, I mean, all these are rare. I wouldn't say that they are common, but these are the they are causes for intractable epilepsy. So they have intractable focal epilepsy, and they, their presentation is mainly epilepsy, a partial is continuous. That means continuously they may be having uh, epilepsy in the sense like they may not be, uh, they may not be uh, you know, unconscious or anything, but they sometimes will be having moving or jerks of the upper limb or the hand or whatever, and they can have progressively goes on progressive, so progressive hemiparesis and progressive intellectual decline over months or years. And uh, it is showing uh, ipsiductal changes, but uh, most of these changes may not correlate with the partial scan. You may uh, expect to see like discharges continuously having with this seizure, but sometimes it may not correlate with that. And if you do uh, MRIs, uh, repeated MRIs, you will show the uh, see the progressive atrophy of one hemisphere. So if you do MRI at one day like today and then you see some sort of atrophy and then you repeat it in three months or six months you will see it has progressively worsened. And then the voltage gated potassium channel antibody or the LG1 uh, I1 and mediated epilepsy where the children present with developmental regression and then the seizures are called, like classical where they have facial and brachial like arm and the face is involved especially with the grimace and arm um, dystonia. They may have movement disorder, they can have ataxia, and they will be sleepless uh, throughout the night and their blood pressures and the pulse rates may not be, uh, may be fluctuating and EG uh, again uh, will be slowing of the background only and sometimes they may show multifocal and generalized discharges. So um, 
sometimes it's not very specific uh, for us to guide through so like what is it so you need to think and then you know uh, to uh, direct your investigations along that and then um, the other entity which you are very familiar with is anti nmda receptor encephalitis where the patients mostly present with the psychiatric and behavioral changes and they may stop talking or they may talk more sometimes they may have mutism uh, and they, again, the insomnia is a feature in, I think, probably the two of them. And uh, they can have seizures and they can have decreased level of awareness. They can have dyskinias, right? And then EEG again uh, might show non-specific slowing only. But uh, when you look at the EEG carefully, uh, you have, uh, you can see the continuous one to three hertz delta with the uh, burst of fast acting that is called a extreme delta brush so that is kind of a thing that if you find that in the eg then you are sure that you are dealing with this and you have to remember that in anti nmd receptor encephalitis you need to consider the imaging of the abdomen because these patients some of these especially the girls who come with this condition may have teratomas ovarian teratomas that we can resect and cure this condition the treatment options in all three or all immune epilepsy, I have discussed only three, there are many more. Uh, so uh, treatment options are the steroids, the intravenous immunoglobulins, the plasmapheresis and other immunomodulators like azathioprine and rituximab. And of course in uh, NMDA you can even remove the teratoma if you find any. And uh, the recovery rates are better in this group where it's up to 80% if treated promptly and identified the so what happens mostly is these patients are not misdiagnosed as either psychiatric problem or uh, some other thing. So then uh, you don't treat them appropriately. That's the reason why they are not being properly treated. So since now this is an upcoming topic, I think all of you should consider this whenever you see a patient and have a uh, suspicion on this. So that, that will improve the outcomes of these patients if you treat uh, well. So coming to the end of my presentation, so what I want to, you to take home from this uh, lecture is that intractable epilepsy is about 25% in the childhood, so which is not a small number. And before labeling as intractable seizures or epilepsy, make sure that you are dealing with the correct diagnosis. You have at least attempted to do a correct, accurate diagnosis. And uh, as you can see, many etiological factors have been implicated and options other than antiepileptic drugs and improve the seizure control like uh, and the neurobehavioral outcomes especially the ketogenic diet and the newer advances like target specific therapy have shown good results like the everlimus and uh, and the uh, like in immune therapies for these uh, immune epilepsies right? and uh, Early referral to specialized epilepsy centers with multidisciplinary input with other professionals show a promising outlook for these children. So you should not disregard the uh, multidisciplinary uh, aspects or the inputs with neuropsychology, surgery, OT, PT, SLT and the teachers. So thank you very much.